Let's see. Great. So thank you to Christina who started the recording as host. Um, my name is Cynthia Ippoliti and I am the chair of the ALERT Teaching, Learning and Technologies Committee. I am really excited to welcome everyone here today. As I said before, we are pretty much at capacity for this meeting, so very exciting that everyone is able to join us today. I want to extend a very warm thank you to the committee for all of their work in helping me and the speakers put this, put this program together. We're all very excited to be able to share this information with you. Just a couple of logistical things. If you could please go ahead and mute yourselves, that would be wonderful. And then we will allow time for Q&A at the end of the session. You can either use the chat uh, to ask your question or if you'd like to go ahead and use your mic, that would be great as well. And I will just read very briefly everyone's um, bios. I'll read just a fraction of their bios. Their full bios were available on the program information. And then after that, I will go ahead and turn it over to them. And so we have with us today, we have Christina Calhoun, who is the instructional designer for the Edmund Lowe Library at Oklahoma State University. She has experience as a teacher, curriculum specialist, trainer, and instructional designer, and holds a Master's of Science in Educational Technology. Next, we have Steele Wagstaff, who is the Educational Client Manager at Pressbooks, a small Canadian startup which makes open source book publishing software. Before joining Pressbooks, he worked at the University of Wisconsin-Madison for more than a decade, and most recently as an instructional consultant in the College of Letters and Science. Next, we have Brian Olandike, who is the lead developer on a platform called ELMS, Learning Network, which has released millions of lines of code over the last decade in pursuit of better open source systems for education and the web. And finally, we have Kathy S. Miller, who is the Open Educational Resources Librarian at Oklahoma State University. Her background is in arts education, and she has classroom music teaching experience with PK-12 and in higher education. And so with that, again, thank you and welcome everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic, and I will turn it over to Christina and the group. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me all right? Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. <laughs> Excellent, okay. Well, thank you all for joining us and thank you, Cynthia, for that introduction. Um, we will just go ahead and get started here. Um, Today we have a few objectives that we want to get through. Um, we want to set a um, shared understanding before we begin of what we mean by open educational resources or OER as you hear us say, um, and what that role of learning analytics is, what exactly is learning analytics and what that might look like for open educational resources. Um, we're going to take a look at how um, us at Oklahoma State, at Penn State, and at Wisconsin, how we've tackled this and what that journey has looked like. And then we'll go through some frameworks um, for ethically and legally incorporating learning analytics into OER, um, which is something that is um, a very big deal. <laughs> um, so, and Kath, uh, no, sorry, not Kathy, I was looking at her face. Um, Cynthia already did a nice introduction of us, so you know who we are. I can just skip right past this. Um, before we begin, I put a poll in the um, chat, but I'm gonna go ahead and put it in there again. Um, and I will give you everyone just about 30 seconds to pop in there and um, do this quick poll. Gauge your level of involvement with OER and learning analytics. Maybe you've never worked with it before. Maybe you've dabbled in a little bit of each. Um, and go ahead and click on that link, the Google link there if you can, and um, just select one and it will all show the results on the next screen. I'll give you about five more seconds. Okay. Now let's see what we've got here. Oh, my did not update. Give me one second here. Alrighty, so most people have, are exploring OER right now, but haven't yet thought about learning analytics. Um, that seems to be the majority of people. Um, and then second up is having implemented OER, but not yet implemented the learning analytics portion yet. Um, and then we kind of have a smattering of experience throughout. 
So thank you all for sharing. That is very good to know jumping into this. Um, and I hopefully our presentation today will kind of cater to um, everybody who, whether you have had no experience with this whatsoever, to those who have tried all of this and feel very confident in it. And if you're just joining us, if you could mute your mic, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you. All right, I am going to pass it over to Steele. Give me one second. All right. Thanks, Christina. Um, I think I'm controlling your screen now. I've never done this, but I... <laughs> okay, cool. So the, the thing that I wanted to talk about was just to offer a bit of a working definition for what an open educational resource is or what makes an educational resource an open educational resource OER. Uh, in the real broad sense, let me control the screen again. Okay, great. I just did it. I just made your slide go now. Okay, I'm proud of myself. So the, 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 a real functional definition, this is just one of many, but this is a good one. It was used by the Hewlett Foundation for several years. I'll let all of you kind of read what's on the screen. Um, but if you can't see the screen, the idea is an open educational resource is something that's used for teaching and learning that either resides in the public domain or has been released under a permissive IP license. And that IP license, intellectual property license, usually we, we would say, I think this is commonly accepted that open means that it is free and that it also includes a set of permissions. Um, and there are different definitions for what these permissions are and how they're constructed, but this is a kind of really commonly used one. This was developed by David Wiley several years ago. These, these five R's, as they're sometimes called, are usually described as constitutive of open content or open educational resources. If, if a content is really open, it gives everyone the permission to do these five R things. It gives them the permission to retain the content, to reuse it, to revise it, to remix it, and to redistribute. If content has a license that allows you to do those five things, it's open. If it's not, then it's not really open. And we generally would uh, assume that in most cases, if not, content that has these five permissions is free. When it's a digital resource, it, it, it is free. Sometimes print resources have costs associated with them, and some of these rights are more difficult when you have print material. Um, you'll notice in the bottom right of this slide, for example, I included a little icon. This is a Creative Commons license. This is the CCBY license. The most common ways for open content to be made open or openly licensed are to use these set of Creative Commons licenses, though there are many ways that, that material can be licensed. Um, or if something is in the public domain, meaning that it's out of copyright, that would be considered an open educational resource as well. So that's kind of what we wanted to share is like a functional working definition for OER. I expect that many of you are already familiar with that. It looked like there was a high visibility for OER in that initial survey. The next kind of thing that I wanted to work, work on and think about was the idea of learning analytics or MA. So the question that we wanted to pose is, what are learning analytics? Can we work towards a functional definition? And how can or should they be used? These are not easy questions to answer, but in terms of providing a functional definition of learning analytics, we wanted to start here. Um, there's a really nice uh, Educause Seven Things to Know paper written by some colleagues of ours that's referenced here. But um, the definition that they gave is a really nice one. It's the use of data analysis and predictive modeling to improve teaching and learning. For the purposes of our talk, I'm gonna suggest that learning analytics consists of three components. One are a set of statements about activity. Two is the storage of those statements, which is kind of a complicated process. And three are insight or analysis of those statements, what we understand uh, as a result of having gathered that information. So that's what learning analytics is in terms of a working definition. The reason why we, we care about learning analytics, I think, ought to be, one, we wanna help learners achieve their goals. So we can give them greater insight into how their learning is going. That should help them make decisions about how they want to learn better or learn differently. Second, we also do wanna help teachers and designers 
understand how effective the stuff they make is. How effective was this activity? Is it working? Is it doing what I designed it to do? Or is my lesson plan or my teaching material helping people learn? And the third reason that we might want to use learning analytics would be to conduct iterative or continuous improvement of content and of design, particularly with OER. Because OER gives us the permission to revise, uh, remix, and do other things with, um, that should be or could be a part of our instructional design, including when we use other people's instructional resources. We referenced a really nice article by Bob Bodily, Rob Nyland, and David Wiley, 2017, where they developed a framework called the RISE framework that helps people think about a way to do this specifically with OER. And so these are, this is the kind of frame that we wanted to give, or the, the big picture that we wanted to set for what learning analytics is and why we should care about it. Now, real quickly, when we talk about those three components, one is the statements. Usually, there are, there are really two different standards that people use to capture learning analytic statements today in practice. One of them is called XAPI, and the other is called Caliper Analytics. They both were released uh, less than five years ago, and they have similar structures. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. They usually describe an actor, or yeah, an actor, an action, and an object. I mistyped it in my slides there. It says action, action, but it meant to say actor action and an object. So someone did something and then it can contain some context. The history of XAPI is that it was developed by the Department of Defense in the United States to replace something called SCORM, which was an older way of capturing learning information that was often used with learning management systems. Caliper Analytics is a standard that's maintained by IMS Global, which is a standards making body for higher education specifically. Um, so that's that's what statements are. Um, and we'll show some examples later to make that more clear. The second piece of, of the learning analytics puzzle is that you need storage. Usually, once you start generating statements, you're going to be producing thousands of these. They're going to be, you just, you make all of these statements and they need somewhere to go. And this is a new piece. This is something that many institutions or universities don't already have in place. And so it's kind of a new landscape since the statements themselves are full. The place that learning uh, analytic statements are stored is often called a learning record store or an LRS. It's essentially a big database where statements get stored. They can be, they can be structured in certain ways. Um, XAPI are JSON objects, which is JavaScript object notation, and Caliper Analytics are JSON linked data. So they both have similar kind of structures and they live in databases that can hold those statements. And the learning record store is like an important piece for keeping track of where that stuff is and storing it longer term. There are open source options for learning record store. Some institutions are building their own, some are buying them, some are um, doing SaaS solutions, but essentially you have a big database and you want to be able to call, make calls on that database to understand things. And that leads us to this last piece. Uh, it's no good just having a huge database if you're not actually getting any insight from it or making it useful. Uh, most of these statements are complex and there's millions of them in many cases. So to make them useful, we have to help have help seeing trends or patterns. So we can think about dashboards, we can think about report, reports, we can think about visualizations. In most cases, these are either simplifications or some kind of model that helps us understand a huge mass of data in a way that helps us gain insight or understand a problem or a question that we have. Um, with greater clarity. These could be built for learners, they can be built for instructors, they could be built for administrators, or they could be built for others. And who they're built for and why they're built are important questions which we'll tackle later in this ethical section. That's a little bit of the framework about learning analytics. I don't know if there's anything in the chat that we needed to address right now, but that's hopefully a, a bit of a frame that helps us talk about some specifics now. I'm gonna go first and talk about um, what we've been doing at our various schools, and I'll talk a little bit about some work that I was involved with at the University of Wisconsin. Uh, I, I was at the University of Wisconsin full-time until last November, and now I'm just there one day a week, but this is a past project that we had worked on a bit. The idea was that we had a bunch of these, these two types of activities. They're called critical readers. They're basically close reading activities for literature and case scenarios. All of these activities would involve a primary text of some kind, some interpretive gloss, some interactive quizzing in context, 
and often some, some learner exploration. So in the case scenarios, it was often a branching scenario where you're imagining that you're a physician and you're given a, a, treat, a, a patient with some, some symptoms and you have to make diagnostic decisions. These activities were built with two tools. Um, we used Pressbooks, which is an open source book publishing tool. That's where I work now. And we also used Articulate Storyline, which is a expensive proprietary software that does e-learning uh, authoring stuff. Um, the, the activities that we created could be both placed on the public web as OER, or they could be placed within a learning management system via a standard called LTI. And this is a little bit of a, here's a little diagram or a little example of what one of these press books activities looked like inside of Canvas. So you can see on the left hand side, there's a poem, and then there's a bit of highlighted text that in yellow, that's figure number one. Figure number two is an example of a glossary term with the definition provided by the instructor. Figure number three shows that there's some interactive media. There's an audio file and a video that explains or glosses the text. Figure number four shows an annotation layer. We're using an open source tool called Hypothesis to build some annotation in. And figure number five shows an interactive quiz. This is built with another open source tool called H5P. And we built that activity into the annotation layer. And that activity is transmitting X API statements. If you want to see other examples of these activities, I put a link to a, like a, a press book that has like, I think a hundred or 200 of these activities that we had built over time. Um, the next slide here kind of shows a diagram for how it all connects. In the upper left, you have the authoring tool. This was a bunch of open source tools that we Frankenstein together as a authoring platform. And, and then it, that tool connects Via to the learning management system, it pushes content into the learning management system via LTI and something called thin common cartridge. So a live version of the text is published in the learning management system. The H5P component is also sending hundreds of X API statements as a learner does something in the book into our learning record store. Both of those pieces are pretty stable. Um, you could download and install them and do them yourself right now. The third piece is an experimental piece that I would say is not quite stable yet, but it's kind of exciting. It's a, another connector that we built that would go into the learning record store, gather up a bunch of statements as a single grade value, and send it back to the grade book in the learning management system. We also were working on building visualizations or dashboards based on information in the learning record store. The map for storyline looks really similar, but more complicated. You publish in Storyline, you have to take the activity package, you upload it into a special WordPress multi-site that's running this GrassBlade LRS plugin. There's a bunch of complicated acronyms and, and other plugins, but the idea is basically the same. You take content, you connect it to the learning management system via something called LTI, you send statements via whatever plugin to a learning record store, and then voila, you have a bunch of information and hopefully you can do something with it to help learning. Um, in both cases, we were storing these in a learning record store called Learning Locker. This is an open source learning record store, and this was an example of what the dashboard used to look like on an old version. You can see there's how many statements have been gathered. This was at the very beginning of the phrase. Phase. You'll see Brian's statement with, or Brian's example with like over a million statements. So this gets big quickly. Um, here's a list of what X API statements might look like. You can see up here, there's just a guest and an IP number. This would be statements that were generated by, to a visitor on the open text. We didn't capture um, their name. This was an anonymous thing. We didn't have to capture the IP number, but that's what was being captured at the time. And here's an example of statements that were generated by a known user, someone who did this activity in the learning management system. This was me. You can see, oh, I know who you are because you're authenticated through our university system. And because we're that university, we will capture those statements and store them. Um, the, here's an example of an X API statement. I'm not gonna explain it in great depth, but I'll leave it as a slide reference if you wanna kind of dig in and understand these statements a bit better. They follow a basic pattern, and here I've annotated where the actor is. This was me. The action was I answered, and what did I answer? I answered this particular activity. Here's a URL, here's the text. It was a fill in the missing word activity. Here was the expected answer, and here's what I actually answered. And then there's a whole bunch of context. The context can be really, really useful. The context in this case tells me, what's the parent activity that it belonged to? What's it grouped with? And what was the result? 
you did this thing, I answered this thing, and I got one out of two. That's an important piece of context. It's a value. Um, and so that's what an X API statement looks like. Caliper analytic statements, as I said earlier, are very similar. The major difference between them is that they use a controlled vocabulary for actions. And that's very helpful because then you can have confidence that you can compare actions across different tools reliably. So every tool hypothetically or ideally should use the same verbs to describe behaviors. That's not the case for XAPI. So it's sometimes difficult to compare actions across tools. Um, you can also generate what are called reports in Learning Locker, right? I could filter by action or by actor, which is who, by action, by object, by location, by result, by time. And then I could create a subset of statements that I could view or download or visualize in some way. The, the other thing that you can do is build visualizations with their dashboard tools. So here's an example of a bunch of visualizations that we were experimenting with and, and visualizing based on underlying data that would help us understand more of a, how our class or how a set of learners did on a particular activity. So that's the basic idea. That's what we were working on in Wisconsin. I think that work is still in its infancy, but it is very exciting. And you can see probably already some potential for teaching and learning across a range of different um, learning platforms. I'm going to pass control over to Brian Allendyke, who's going to talk about some work they've been doing at Penn State. Hey, Steele, while you do that, do you want to answer a question in the list that says, how yeah. are those statements generated? Great. Um, so the statements in this case, they're generated by H5P. So what will usually happen is some tool needs to be instrumented to produce a set of statements. So the tool itself has to understand what the framework is and make a statement whenever some behavior is triggered. And the second piece is you have to have something, it's usually called a sensor, that listens for those statements and directs them to a learning record store. Hopefully that's a good 30 second explanation. That wasn't super technical, I hope. Nailed it. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, hi, I'm Brian Ollendike. I work at Penn State. I get to wear t-shirts to work, apparently. Um, and I'm going to try to cover all the different things going on in the OER space at Penn State. I'll try to focus more on the things that uh, my, my group is working on. Uh, but we've got a lot of different efforts um, across the libraries here. Uh, Earth and Mineral Sciences was really a leader in uh, open education uh, locally, but nationally as well. They've been doing this for a very long time. Um, so let's look at what some of those are. So the library uh, provides access to different services, right? Assessment and discovery of OER, how to uh, adopt and adapt, a lot of advocacy types of things. They run some trainings, to try and get more people interested. Um, so anything that Steele mentioned with Pressbooks, we have access to as well via Pressbooks instance um, and the Open Textbook Network. So as far as EMS, EMS currently has 76 online courses. Those are pretty much just sitting out in the open. Um, you do have to click through some, some forms and things if you wanna actually download all the materials for Remix. Um, these don't do any tracking out in public. However, based on the way that they've crafted this solution, they can repurpose those resources internally and do some tracking if, if, they, if they wanted to. So it'd be a common theme at Penn State with our solutions is attempting to uh, bridge the gap between kind of closed, uh, behind the scenes, things that might do learning analytics into an LMS or into an LRS, but yet still repurposing the content for an open audience. So this is an example, just screen grab of one of their courses they can go through. Um, they use a Drupal-based system for you know, managing their content. Um, so one of the issues that we're concerned about um, on our team is the long-term tracking and repurposing of OER. And so there's an initiative that a um, faculty member in our college named Michael Collins has been working on called OER Schema. Um, the idea behind OER Schema is basically to create an ontology that can have a common educational centric uh, language, but wrapped into the, the underpinnings of all the resources we produce. So it's great to use a text editor, whether that's in Drupal or Pressbooks or Markdown or just a text file or a PDF. Um, and it's another thing to indicate, hey, that video I put on it, that is um, part of module four and it's an activity and it's linked to a project that I want someone to accomplish. Right? So actually getting into the pedagogy and the intention behind the material 
uh, something that a screen, a screen scraper could come by and learn from. Uh, so that's kind of, we're setting this wiring in place so that, you know, 10 years from now, we don't just have learning objectives scattered everywhere. We actually have the fundamentals of what people wrote claiming to be learning objectives. And that's, that's an important underpinning when it comes to where does that data come from? Because uh, steel covered, hey, this is an X API statement and emits from, you know, ABC location. Um, we want to get to a point where our OER lives pretty much anywhere in any system and yet still bubbles up data that we can use in a meaningful way. Um, so another, another OER effort, and this, uh, this one I got to be a part of, was kind of cool. Um, it's uh, stem-researchethics.org. Uh, it's running uh, a copy of Elm's Learning Network, which is the t-shirt, um, a platform that we work on here. Um, and so it's rolled out in such a way that there's like 10 or so um, open courses, but it's using the same fundamental course technology that the College of Arts and Architecture uses to deploy you know, 100 or so online courses. So I think it's really important when you're working in this direction, thinking about learning analytics, and then platforms are gonna immediately come to that, to say, well, how can we repurpose efforts we already have? Pressbooks is another great example. Pressbooks is built on WordPress. A lot of universities have WordPress developers or people that can help support WordPress. And so then a natural extension on top of WordPress of learning analytics becomes a little bit easier to tackle. Um, so this is kind of part of a larger vision of the way we develop and roll things out. Um, coined by Educause is NGDLE, or Next Generation Digital Learning Environment. Basically, uh, when Steele is saying, hey, there's a learning record store, LRS, um, you can see on our chart there, I have a little squirrel because that's what the logo for uh, Learning Locker was at one time. Um, but it's just this vision that data is coming to and from uh, many different places, right? So there, the LMS is no longer the source of truth. We need other solutions to be able to capture these experiences. And yes, it might send that experience back to the LMS, but it's really important to think more holistically about where education is going on all over the place. So we are also using um, uh, Learning Locker internally. Uh, you can see there's a screenshot from our, our setup that has 1.8 million records almost. Uh, we've been running this for about a year. It, it's used in a rather passive manner. So we've got um, 100-ish, uh, like 85 or so, uh, online courses using this technology. And so we're kind of uh, abstracting our learning records requirement from the content itself so that we can release it openly. The content that this is monitoring isn't open uh, currently. Uh, but you can see we have, you know, latest reports there as well. I don't, I won't dig into them. Um, that have to do with you know whether or not a video was engaging, asking questions about Canvas, how's our orientation going, things like that. So why we want to get you know, or start planning for a distributed future um, is because I don't think that OER platforms are very good right now. No offense, Steele. Um, just in general, they're they're really poor when it comes to authoring quality. Um, I've seen a lot of workshops that we even run that have to do with teaching faculty how to work with Markdown um, or in the libraries. I'm sure it comes up all the time. What platform do we use? Where does this go? It has to eventually live somewhere. And eventually all efforts are gonna look like MIT's open courseware, here's a bunch of PDFs, if we don't have a great platform to handle this. So we've been working on something, um, I'll demonstrate really quickly here, called hackstheweb.org. It is a, um, hacks is short for headless authoring experience, meaning that while it may seem a bit absurd, all of the things that take place in the browser currently um, are things that could be funneled into, uh, say, Pressbooks even. Um, there, we have a WordPress plugin for hacks, uh, so that if I wanted to take this silly thing about web components and instead say OER, it's, whoops, it's everywhere. That I shouldn't need to understand how to get an image and meme it, that's a silly example. I shouldn't have to understand how to pull in an article from Wikipedia about WordPress. I should be able to just search WordPress without going anywhere, no matter, you know, again, envision that this authoring experience lives anywhere, and then embed an article about WordPress, which I can't do because apparently I'm clicking through on this other screen here. <laughs> And it's a live demo. Why would anything work in a live demo? Um, but that when I would click through to that, it's supposed to generate a 
Wikipedia reference that I could license my work, say it's share alike, and that I'm the creator of that work, and that I accessed it at whatever address, and try to break the barriers down. Like look at that one interaction right there. This is a semantically accurate uh, citation. That is a day's worth of training to understand the different licensing requirements, how to properly document, how to put it in place. These are things that are problems everyone's gonna end up having. And so we need to rethink the way we handle our platforms to, to better meet those needs. So you can go to hacksaweb.org, play with it. Um, it's like its own whole thing. <laughs> um, oh, hacks the demo, that's what it says there. Uh, so hacks currently has integrations with all of these different places and the idea is that we're, we're storing everything as HTML, uh, make, breaking down the barriers for authorship for people and then in those elements and things that are constructed in the page, we're actually able to emit XAPI or caliper data. Uh, so we're kind of in this wiring phase of preparing for the, the world to come. So that gonna turn it on over now. How do I give you control or are you just gonna take control? All right, well, we'll let them negotiate control and I'll talk a little bit about uh, what's been happening with open educational resources here at Oklahoma State University. Um, am I coming through? Yep. Excellent. All right, so um, kind of what we'd like to talk about in this section of it is the importance of having a long range plan and articulating uh, and documenting and externalizing your process. Uh, I came on board and was privileged to join a program that was already ongoing. They had several works in the authorship stage. Um, but then as we tried to shift from a project to a program, or another way to think of it is shifting from a passion project to a strategic plan, uh, we've kind of uh, struggled a little bit trying to uh, figure out how to articulate ex exactly what we're gonna do. So what we've, we've decided to do is just we, we need to discern our values and then the tie into learning analytics is as we discern what our values are, then we can figure out what it is we want to measure and when, and then how best to measure them. Um, and so just going and gathering all the data you probably can and then making sense of it later, uh, be considerate of your students and determine ahead of time what exactly you want to measure. Um, one of the questions we've been considering, and I have it written down here articulately, as uh, we work on a long-term plan is kind of whether we want um, our values to be more aligned with the, the values of the commons uh, which has to do with access and equity, or if we want to have it more tied to the values of the market, which has to do with maximizing economic uh, capability. And um, we, we haven't quite, we haven't figured out the right balance. So what we have determined is that it maybe is okay to do both. Uh, and we're hoping we can find a balance of both. Uh, but how do you, how do you measure both? Because they, the measurements for them are each a little different. And I think Christina is going to go a little bit more into detail about how we're looking at that. Yes, I am. Okay, so um, continuing on what Kathy was just speaking about here at Oklahoma State University at the library, um, before we started any of our learning analytics uh, upon this journey, we um, found this article by Amy Collier um, where she talks about creating digital sanctuaries for students that minimize their risk um, when it comes to technologies and things that they encounter at our institutions. And so this was kind of our guiding principle was that as we create any sort of OER, whether it's an open textbook or an open educational resource, whatever it might be, we want to ensure, um, and somebody had asked in the chat about data privacy, we want to ensure that we are protecting our students first and foremost because um, like Steel covered in the beginning, when we're collecting this data, it's not just because, you know, we want to sell their information somewhere or something like that. Um, we want to make sure that we're using it ethically um, and for a specific purpose. Um, so here to talk a little bit about what we did um, at um, the OSU library, um, we had a nice long process because <laughs> nobody, um, I'm the only instructional designer here and nobody really had tackled learning analytics before. Um, and so we had our own e-textbook platform that we weren't collecting any analytics on at the time because we wanted to make sure that we were protecting students and we didn't have anything set up. And so eventually along came um, a conference where I met Brian and Steele and had some great talks with them because being the only person here that was trying to work on this, I was kind of like, okay, well, somebody help me. And uh, they were great to uh, talk with me. And you'll notice some of the similarities here on this slide to what they've done at their institutions. Um, 
And so uh, moving forward, you know, we, we got Kathy on board and we have um, our OER program is growing um, exponentially at this point. And um, we started using Pressbooks for our open textbooks um, where we can collect uh, Google Analytics um, and XAPI for our open tutorials. And XAPI is what um, uh, both Brian and Steele talked about using. Um, and I am not a coder to begin with. I am an instructional designer, but I do not, I, I, I can do some basic things, but I'm not gonna sit at a website and like be very technical about things. So um, I have put, we're gonna set up the slides later. I put some resources in this slide in the notes for those of you who are kind of like, oh my gosh, what does any of this mean? I don't know how to start. Um, I pretty much taught myself how to get started on this um, and went through resources from Steele and Brian and many, many other people. Um, I've also created a LibGuide, which I've linked in there to kind of help you get started. Um, that links a bunch of these LRSs that have been talked about, um, you know, how to how to kind of get going with this. Um, so what we used at the library here is we use Storyline 3, um, which is not, again, the most open tool, but it is an industry standard for instructional design. Um, we host them on WordPress. This is extremely similar to what Steele talked about, the setup that they have, um, where we have Grassblade, um, plugin and LRS. So all of our data when students um, click on our tutorials goes to uh, the Grassblade LRS, which um, I'll talk about what this is in just a second, but it looks like this um, kind of, you know, similar to the reports that you saw on the other pages where you get this information. Um, and you'll see here I've blocked out the IP address um, from these people. We get anonymous. Um, our uh, coding sends us anonymous names for whoever uses it. We don't collect names of students. Um, now, if we were to put this into a class, that's a different story because we're collecting um, graded information, but for just openly hosting it on our site, we just want very general information about how people are using it. We don't need to know who they are to pr protect students. Um, and back to this, this is what it looks like in one of our storyline slides. Um, in order to get that statement of how a student is using this tutorial, um, there's a simple JavaScript code that I put on this button. So when a student clicks the button, this code sends a statement to my LRS that tells me what they did. So, you know, this is probably it right here, the basement map one. Um, so again, for those of you who have never dabbled in this, I'm sure that this could probably seem very overwhelming to, to look at, but um, with the right tools in place and the right knowledge in place, it's actually quite simple um, once you have it all together and sorted out in your brain um, and is something that is incredibly, incredibly helpful um, to your OER initiative. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the ethical and legal, legal considerations, which again, somebody asked in there. Um, yeah, Steele said he's self-educated too and very little formal technical training. Yep, exactly, exactly. It can be done, people. Um, so um, one of the reasons why it took us a while to get started on this um, was because we wanted to ensure that we were protecting our students' privacy and that we were doing so in an ethical and legal way um, because having students' information on hand is can be um, you know, safe to begin with, but you never know who will get their hands on it later, where will it be stored, um, all those different parts of learning analytics that Steele mentioned at the beginning. Um, part of that is where are you going to keep it and what are you going to do with it? Um, so Audrey Waters, she um, said that all along the way, or perhaps somewhere along the way, we have confused surveillance for care. When you work for a company or an institution that collects or trades data, you're making it easy to surveil people and the stakes are high. They're always high for the most vulnerable, which is our students. Um, by collecting so much data, you're making it easy to discipline people, you're making it easy to control people, and you're putting people at risk. You're putting students at risk. So this is kind of the flip side to like, yes, learning analytics are excellent and great and they can be very helpful, but please remember first and foremost that you have that data and it can, can be used for evil, basically. Um, so we don't have to throw away the learning analytics. We just need to kind of rethink the way we, we view it and the way we use it. Um, 
So Amy Collier said that we need to recognize and deconstruct our perspectives on the relationship of data to our understanding of student learning. So not that we have to throw it away and not use it, but just kind of rethink the way we do it so that we are putting student privacy um, for, as first and foremost. So um, kind of the way that we framed it here at OSU was we thought about it from an ethical it, with an ethical framework that we got from the um, Santa Clara University Marcula Center for Applied Ethics. Um, and we asked ourselves five questions. And this has helped us as we are, we are now currently in the process of developing our privacy policies, um, which we will post on our site for students to be able to access um, and also opt out of if they choose. Um, and when I say posting them on the site, not like 17 pages long in size five font. I'm talking about things that actual human beings, not robots, understand. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, we asked ourselves what um, to kind of learning analytics and policy will lead to the most po positive consequences for students? What will harm them? Um, what alternatives could we uh, consider? How can we most respect students' rights? How can we ensure that with our learning analytics collection that we're um, ensuring equity and that we are not harming certain um, possibly marginalized communities or students? Um, how can we advance the common good? And what can enable our moral virtues? What can make us be the best um, possible OER um, providers that, uh, that, are, um, that we can be? I'm going to pass it over to Brian. Oh, you don't need to pass it, but. Oh, okay. Uh, so, I'm <laughs> sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so, without getting deep in the weeds into the actual legal requirements involved here, um, I think we're all familiar with FERPA or like IRB as far as, you know, human test subjects and things we need to do in an education context. But that third one on there uh, becomes really important to consider when it comes to OER. So, GDPR um, is more or less that European Union citizens, when they visit your websites, and again, now we're moving, why it's important to talk platforms is we're moving beyond just LMSs and these closed environments into the more open web, no matter how we get there. Um, that whenever EU citizens are on your websites, you need to respect the laws governing the EU. Um, and so GDPR, Briefly is that you have the right to be forgotten like the data should be anonymized and um, Most of the time you unfortunately see this as a little pop-up that says like hey, we collect data Do you care and if you say yes? I care then basically that's the flag where you're not allowed to to do any tracking with them um, So it's just Im important to realize that different laws are going to start to apply because you're putting things out in the open and potentially collecting uh, data that collection of data could even be how many people access this website? So it's a it's a different game for sure from what we're used to. All right, and Steele, if you'd like to jump in here. Yeah, I wanted to just say, I think there's a few other considerations that are important to ask. Like there's a series of practical questions. And before you begin collecting learning analytics, I think it's really important to have clear uh, broadly accepted agreement about answers to these questions. What's our policy for storing these records? Where are we going to store them? What's our policy for disposing of them? How long are you going to keep them? And how are you going to make sure that you get rid of them after their period of uses? Are you going to be keeping learning record statements for five years, for 10 years? Hopefully not. And hopefully you have a clear policy for disposing of them after their use has been out. The third question that's really important is, how do we control access to learning analytics records? There's a bunch of big debates and pretty big fights right now, I would say, between ed tech vendors, between institutions, and in some cases between student advocacy, student activist groups. I think we're going to see a lot of this play out in, hopefully, in, in um, legislation on the much larger scale with ed tech, or not, with just, with just technology companies generally. There's a lot of concern about how the big social media and the search giants are gathering consumer information and have done things that a lot of us feel uncomfortable with. And we ought to be able to answer those questions for ourselves at our institutions about learning analytic records. And then there's a couple of philosophical questions that I think are very important to answer. And I have very strong views about them that I won't subject you to here, but I suspect that the many of you will feel sympathetically or will agree because I was also trained as a librarian and that code of ethics informs you know, my values. Um, one is who owns the record? 
of learning activity? Is it the learner? Is it the institution? Is it the tool provider? Hopefully not the last one, probably not the second one, ideally the first one, but what does that look like in a practical sense? Are, the, are you then a steward of a student's learning record? And what does that mean for you and how you do your job? And then the second question, which I think we almost never ask, and we usually get backwards, is who is or are learning analytics primarily for? Are they for administrators? Are they for teachers? Or are they for learners? If they're for learners, how does that affect what you build in terms of the systems and dashboards and what order you prioritize things? Um, I have my own view, which you can find and read more about. Um, I presented about learning analytics and privacy at Open Ed. This was the conference that I met Christina at with Billy Mankey from the University of Hawaii. And I am, uh, don't, you don't, don't actually open the links. Come on. You, um, this is not the presentation for that, but um, just a shameless plug about that. Um, I, I, I think um, answering those questions is an important consideration that, that you should have conversations with many stakeholders about including all of the people that would be affected by your surveillance regime. Um, and uh, that's my view. All right, and I'm gonna jump in here if it's okay and talk a little bit more about what Steele is saying, who about who owns the records and who are the analytics for. We kind of race through the values section, trying to catch up some time. But as you determine whether you're market-based or commons-based, uh, the way you measure effectiveness in the commons is the breadth of distribution and, and the, the the diversity of users that you have. And that's sometimes the most difficult thing to measure in a, a fair and honest and equitable fashion. And you need to, we're finding, we need to get those values set down or else we're gonna end up just measuring whatever's easiest. How, how many people are using it? How much are we saving by using uh, the open textbooks and things like that? So uh, we're, we're finding we really have to be self-disciplined about articulating our values and having the courage to figure out a way to measure our effectiveness in an ethical way that still aligns with our goals. Yes, thank you. Um, so along the lines of these framework, or uh, ethical data use, um, we have some frameworks here of people who have gone about creating policies that they've put on their sites um, that they are actually using now that um, kind of the principles that I won't open it, but Steele's uh, presentation that was up there <laughs> that already highlighted different principles that he um, incorporates, um, where they talk about the principles that they have incorporated into their own policies, such as privacy and transparency, um, and, you know, many other words that I can't think of at this exact moment. <laughs> but wow. I invite you. Go ahead. Christina, this is like the perfect librarian presentation <laughs> because it's a huge link dump, right? So you all can recognize this from your professional lives, I imagine. But just wanted to say, we did provide the obligatory link dump with reference <laughs> citations. <laughs> Yes, exactly. This is for you as you are wanting to dig in deeper later and you're creating your own data policy, which is a foundational um, part to creating a learning analytics ready OER resource, uh, open educational resource. Um, I, we invite you to look through them, look at some of these um, exemplars to see what kinds of things you should be incorporating, you know, data storage, how should you be communicating with students, um, so on and so forth. This could be, this topic of ethics could occupy hours of time to be talked about by itself, which is, you know, again, why we have this link dump here, but um, we encourage you to go through that on your own time. Um, just very quickly, yeah. we can jump back. The, sure. uh, the first three of those links are more broadly about learning analytics more generally in the kind of teaching and learning sphere. Four through six are very library specific. So there's a very big debate about whether any library information should be included in a university's learning analytics package. And so I think these are a couple of, uh, one of these was even grew out of an ALA subgroup, I believe. Some of you might have worked on that. That's the um, number six there. It was the ethics and the research use of library patron data. There's a, there's a lot of controversy about that. So those are a bit more library specific. And then the seventh one is a nice kind of overview article of ethical considerations in, a, in adopting a policy writ large. So. Yes, excellent. Thank you for clarifying that, Steele. Okay, so we've seen some questions come through in the chat, um, and we've tried to get to a few of them as we've gone through, um, but um, if you guys want to 
jump in. I'm going to see. So um, someone asked who or what other units have you collaborated with to develop these policies? Um, I could say that in our building in um, at the OSU library and Kathy, please feel free to jump in. Um, we collaborated with our systems department who sets up um, such as things like our WordPress, um, our hosting, our servers, uh, making sure that our LRS is maintained and that all of this is kept private and secure. Um, we've also collaborated, we have a, a scholarly communications librarian who we have uh, worked at length with to set up um, uh, our OER um, policies and especially the authoring of those things. Um, who am I missing, Kathy? <laughs> ITLE, but I'm trying, I'm looking to see what it, oh, the Institute for Teaching and Learning Excellence. We're also yes. working with them. They're who handle our LMS and, and also uh, they have kind of an inside track, their whole we're really lucky. Their whole their department's whole job is to help us learn how to teach better, and so uh, they've already been looking into this, and we'll kind of piggyback on what they're doing and collaborate with their efforts. Yeah. And Brian and Seal, if you guys would like to jump in, maybe if, uh, if you have anything to add with who you guys worked with. Yeah. Sorry. Um, at the University of Wisconsin Madison, there is a learning analytics roadmap committee that's been handling most of this. Um, Wisconsin is a very decentralized place with a lot of committees, and um, you may recognize that at your institution. So there's a group called LARC at UW-Madison. The person who I think is probably the most knowledgeable person on our campus about these issues is a woman named Kim Arnold, who some of you may know from the Learning Analytics community. She was at Purdue University previously. She developed a very well-known dashboard system that had kind of signal lights and has been really active. Madison also belongs to a consortium called Unison, and Unison is a big consortium of R1 schools, Penn State's also part of it, that's been very heavily interested in developing a common data model and storing large bodies of institutional learning analytics and owning that process themselves. There are, they're all, they're all, they are all public R1s that share some mission values. Um, and so that's something that Madison has been heavily involved in. All right, in the chat, um, someone uh, asked if there's collaboration with the provost's office, and yes, there was I should have mentioned that first. Um, he's very much, our provost has been very much uh, been supportive of the implementation of OER here at Oklahoma State University, and, and then we go back and, and he checks in and we get approval, but as far as actual uh, construction and development of, of the frameworks and, and the policies, we, we kind of are externalized over here with that, if that makes any sense. But yeah, the provost is involved. Um, there was another question that was asked above there, uh, above, at, way above in the chat here that said, what, kind, what is the learning curve for designing tutorials and storyline? Do you need JavaScript, HTML, XML? Um, and I would say that um, JavaScript is one that you would probably need to know eventually fully, but some of the resources out there um, now, at the beginning of XAPI, there was really nothing out there, but now there are some resources where people will literally say, take this line of code, put it in this place and do this. <laughs> so um, if you are just getting started, um, some of the resources I've included in the notes section of our slide um, do tell you do X, Y, and Z. Um, so if you're just getting started, don't feel like you need to you know, learn a million different coding languages up front. Um, there is some really good helpers out there. And there are even places that are now developing automated JavaScript um, trigger um, things where it'll automate it for you. Um, they're not really mainstream. I'm definitely none that I've seen in the OER world yet. Uh, so for pay, I'm not sure if you guys have seen them. Um, but yes, yeah, so um, you do need to know some code, but if you don't know any yet, it's okay. You don't need to know everything. I would also add, there's a number of tools that produce XAPI statements already. And sometimes the tool itself is engineered to produce certain kinds of statements. That's the, that's the case for H5P, for example. So when we were using H5P, no one has touched JavaScript or PHP or other things. The statements just work, and we just set up a listening uh, a route to send them to a learning record store. When it comes to Caliper Analytics or other kinds of tools, you may say, hey, we have this really interesting tool, but it doesn't yet produce the statements that we want. And in those cases, you, what it's called is instrumenting the tool with a sensor. That's the kind of technical language. And Caliper Analytics was developed, as I said, by IMS Global. The lead authors, most many of them were at the University of Michigan. Um, but 
There are sensors that are built, the most commonly used sensors I think are built in JavaScript, PHP, or, and there's a, a sensor in Ruby. So if you have or you know of a developer with experience in any of those three tools, they should be able to work with the existing libraries and implementations to try to instrument another tool to produce these statements. And then, then the problem is where do I put them? Do I have a learning record store? And then the problem is how do I make them useful? How do I visualize them? So there's a lot of kind of gnarly thorny problems there, but there's a lot of interesting minds working together on it. And when we do it in the open, we do it a lot better and a lot faster. Christina, Sheena had a question earlier in the chat about uh, using Storyline in lib apps. I think, I don't know if we got that answered, but if it didn't get answered, Sheena, you could email Christina or Christina, I'm trying to look for it. Um, oh, using LibWizard, but I would like to explore Storyline to build gaming activities. She said she's not sure what she'd be getting herself into. <laughs> Storyline is, if you have used uh, PowerPoint before, it's kind of like PowerPoint on steroids, I feel like, um, where you can make really cool things and interactions in it. So um, there is a little bit of a learning cur curve with Storyline, um, but it's not terrible. And lynda.com, or I'm sorry, I think it's called LinkedIn Learning now. Lin LinkedIn Learning has a lot of um, tutorials on that. Storyline itself has a lot of tutorials on how to use it. Um, and just, you know, on YouTube, you can find a lot as well. Um, so it is, once you get involved in it, it's really not too difficult to learn. Um, Another thing you'd be getting yourself into, I have to say, is an annual license. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is not always the case with open source tools. Right. Yes. I am a huge fan of open source tools instead. Um, like I said, it's industry standard and you can do a lot with it, which is why we chose it, but it is not an OER friendly tool by any means. Um, because if you want somebody else to be able to use your resource that you created, they also have to pay for it. Um, if you get Storyline 3, you don't, you just pay once until they make you upgrade eventually. Um, but Storyline 360, which is their newest tool, which is online, um, is definitely a yearly subscription. Oh, and you know what? Let me go ahead and share this presentation in the chat right now. Um, we will also share this, um, I believe Cynthia said, on the LERT website um, for everybody to um, be able to get. And I think we'll have the recording up there as well. There are our email addresses and Twitter handles. We welcome you guys to send us some questions. Um, we have given you a lot of food for thought today. Um, you've seen, you know, how this has been done at three different places. Um, and I have spoken at length with both Brian and Steele about what they're doing at their institutions. And so if you guys have questions, um, we are more than happy to help. Um, and yeah. And I just want to take the time to thank um, all of you. This has been, I think I saw somebody say on the chat that this has been one of the most informative and information packed webinars. And I have to agree, I'm planning on definitely um, looking back at everything that you covered. I've learned so, so much. Um, so this has been wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, again, the recording and the slides will be available. Thank you to everyone who was able to make the time to join us today. We can stay on maybe for another minute or so have just a couple of minutes left if there's any final questions. Otherwise, thank you all very much and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.